Okay, so we had uh, this panel yesterday, and it was a lot of the majors, the big honchos and things. This is sort of David versus Goliath. These are the indies we want to talk about today that have to struggle and find ways, kind of clever ways, um, to win and make a dent in award season and to win Oscars and, and all the other awards, which isn't easy when you don't have the budgets of the major studios and things, but you have the movies, the quality movies. So let's talk a little bit about that. You know, what is the huge challenge here you have when you don't have those, those uh, dollars to buy these big ads and the billboards around town and things like that? You know, Howard, how do you, how do, you do it? You did it last year with Winner's Bone, for instance. Well, we usually start with the critics uh, uh, a mailing. You know, we, we we send out the screeners to the to the, all of the critics groups across the country first, and we hope to get their support going into the season. I mean, usually it, we're we're working with a film that already got good reviews, so I think that we use the 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 critics and and that that praise to launch us into the award season because I think a film, a smaller film that didn't get amazing reviews has a harder time to make an award splash. But I think if the critics love a movie, it's a way you can start and get the, the, the Academy to notice it as well. And then when you're in the middle, midst of it, you're never going to outspend the studio, so you just try to be more strategic. I mean, last year we had uh, Beautiful, uh, and we were doing a campaign for Javier Bardem for Best Actor, and it's kind of become an apocryphal moment. It did not get, at this time last year, it did not get Golden Globe nomination, did not get a SAG nomination, did not get a Broadcast Film Critic nomination. We thought we were dead, basically. And uh, beginning of January, we had a screening at CA that Julia Roberts um, uh, was the host of, and she had a very memorable quote that got, you know, uh, uh, spread virally on the internet, saying, "If talent doesn't matter, we're all fucked." Excuse me. <laughs> and because of that, I think I, I, the entire actor branch basically picked up the the DVD of Beautiful and watched it. And cut to a month later, he, uh, uh, Javier was nominated. So that's like a. You know, it's one story, but it is very much kind of an indie movie story, which is that that you know you can spend millions of dollars, or you can try and be strategic, make sure that the the people who need to see your movie see your movie, and the movie has to have the goods in the end of the day. For an independent film, I think there's no way for a movie to get nominated, make it through the award season if it's not a really great film. You know, I think that's maybe the difference. Usually, uh, obviously, most most films don't make it through that aren't great films, but especially for an independent film, it's really, it maybe has to be that much better or more unusual or, you know, groundbreaking. I mean, we have a movie this year, Margin Call, that we're, we're doing an awards campaign for, and I think one of its, you know, it, it, virtues vis-a-vis -vis the Academy is that it's a first-time filmmaker. It costs three point three and a half million dollars. It was all shot in 17 days. I mean, it's a great story, and the filmmaker's father worked on Wall Street, and, and you know, so it had that verisimilitude. So I think there's sort of the story behind it. That will that will help Albert Knobs. It's Glenn Close's passion project for 30 years. So an indie movie needs a story probably as well. Well, now there was a sense yesterday on the Moguls panel that a lot of these guys would prefer it if there were five Best Picture nominees. Now, when you're talking about the indie segment, just getting nominated means a great deal. A movie like Winter's Bone went from obscurity to, well, what the heck is this? And it launched Jennifer Lawrence. It did a lot of things. Um, what do you guys think about the, very, about, about the number of nominees and the, the very distinct possibility that there might not be 10 of them this year? Yeah, well, Ryan, you, you benefited last year, too, with The Fighter. You know, uh, Can you talk about that? Do you think it would have gotten in uh, otherwise? Sure. I, I actually think it, it's a great thing. Um, and, and I guess you know, the very topic of this, this, this panel kind of speaks to that, meaning that you know, part of the Oscars are looking for you know, really what is, is it's the ultimate kind of um, determination of the best work. And that doesn't necessarily mean you know, the, the best box office or the person who could spend the most on you know, an award campaign but it means really who, who took the biggest risk and created the best art. I mean, that's really, I think, in a sense, how you define what the Oscars are supposed to be. Um, and by adding the, the extra pictures and having 10, I think it really gives a real shot to pictures that before just got lost, because you, you, you can't outspend the majors. I mean, none of us here, can, we just can't do it. Last year, you know, when we had, we had Fighter, you know, we had a very, very small campaign for the Oscars, and there's just no chance we ever would have even been in it had there not been 10. 
And you know, we ended up. Uh, I think you know, Christian winning and 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 Melissa winning was was really you know a big part of the fact that the picture itself was seen by so many people because it was allowed into that category because there was ten pictures. Um, and I think you know, movies like like Beautiful Movies, which we were uh, partners on on TV on, and um, you know, uh, other movies that that even this year I think are some of the best movies I've seen. Um, are movies that don't have the benefit of 10, 15, 20 million dollar studio, you know, spending campaigns. So, um, t to me, it's a great thing and, and gives a great chance to movies that wouldn't otherwise have it. Is the cost of campaigning more expensive now? Does it rise every year, or is it? Um, I think I don't think it's risen in the past couple of years, just because I think with the economy, you know, it's hard to ask people for more money to do the same thing in a down economy. But I think it's it's expensive to do the kind of bells and whistles it always has been. I mean, the sort of, you know, cardboard fold out things that cost, you know, $100,000 that the majors do um, in, in all the, in, in various issues. I mean, the amount of, of trade advertising, the, the you know, the, the, the number of screenings, the, you know, the phalanx of consultants, I mean, all those things add up into the millions and, and, and they don't, you know, make sense for an independent film. I, I'd say actually from our perspective, I mean last year, I don't know about this year because we're fortunate that we really don't have a specific film in the race so I get to sit back and enjoy watching others. Um, but, but last year, um, you know, one of the things that uh, at least w w seemed noticeable to me is given what's happening with the economy and that the studios are all under a lot of pressure to perform, they're actually spending more money it seems on the Oscars race to kind of prove their performance, meaning the bigger studios, which puts more pressure on you. And it actually makes, you know, I think people that are kind of in the category where we, we know we can't outspend them try and be more innovative um, and find ways to be. Yeah, I, I agree. I would guess that there's more spending this year than last year. Like last year seemed to be the nod towards a, a new dichotomy, a tough economy. And this year is people feeling the need to somehow justify themselves and their and their pictures and their other expenditures by spending more money almost back to to, to prior days. So I'm not sure it pays off. I, I agree with most of what I read about from yesterday and have heard today. It's it's just get the movie seen. Um, get the movie seen and almost everything else takes care of itself. But you did the classic, I, I think of, of recent decades, one of the classic Oscar campaigns showing that if you get the movie seen, however you do it, and you don't spend a lot of money, you wound up winning Best Picture with Crash. Right. Um, what Pete's alluding to, I think, is we were the first ones to send screeners to the entire SAG uh, membership after it was nominated by SAG NomCom. Crash was for Best Ensemble Cast. We sent out the additional 100,000 screeners to everybody in SAG to make sure they got the movie seen. Um, <clears throat> and frankly, it wasn't that expensive. It was ridiculously inexpensive to, to print them, put them in plain paper uh, uh, mailers, and let SAG mail them out for us, so it cost a fraction of what studios spent on, on the bigger budgeted items. But we learned early, the first Oscar campaigns we did at Lionsgate were back in 1998 for Gods and Monsters and Affliction. And none of us had ever worked on an Oscar campaign before. We didn't know what we were doing. Um, we were just trying to pay attention. And we didn't have a pot to piss in. We were, we were tinier than tiny. And uh, so none of us had done anything. We had no money. <clears throat> but we managed to get those two little movies they, they both were nominated for multiple Academy Awards, including Best Actor for both of them. They each won Oscars. Um, and I, we proved to ourselves we didn't need money back then to run the campaigns. Every campaign was different, but if ever there was proof that you didn't need to buy the nominations, uh, those two movies were it. A couple years later with Monsters Ball and Halle Berry, it was different. We still didn't have the money, but for, the, for Halle, we, we told her before the, uh, before the campaign started, she was going to have to be everywhere, that she was going to have to shoulder it. We weren't going to outspend anybody. The movie was tougher than tough. Uh, we released it, I think, on December 26. We knew we needed the awards recognition to give the film liftoff, and she was going to have to be everywhere. She was. We screened the film aggressively, and, and, and great things happened for her. And then the same thing with Crash, um, a couple of years after that, was the conscious decision to release it early in the year, and have people talk about it as maybe the first awards contender of the year. And our hope was by the end of that year, again, without spending big money, but the hope and the, and the strategy was come end of year, maybe all of what were perceived to be the top contenders wouldn't quite measure up. And so people might look back and say, you know, the movie I really liked was Crash. And I think if we had released Crash in December, 
that never would have happened. But establishing it in May, doing well, and people looking back worked out. So all those things, no money, no extra money spent, but just get the movie seen. Well, it, that brings an interesting point in re regard to cost, because what I find is costing so much or more and more or you know is prohibitive in cost is actually the release of the movie into the award season which I think is the most expensive thing because we did on Beautiful and we're doing again on Albert Knobs we're doing a qualifying run in December and then opening the movie the weekend of the nominations because I think the really big money gets spent keeping the film in you know out there especially in New York and LA um, with huge amounts of advertising for week after week after week during this period when you're competing with 20 other films all going after the same audience. So you're trying to do like four things at once. You're trying to keep the movie, you're, you're trying to have sort of overall momentum for the movie. You know, Sony opens a dangerous method the last weekend in November. They get a long way to go to keep it alive, to hope to get a, 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 a nomination, to have the movie continue to do business, have the movie stay in theaters, have it look as big as the other films. I mean, there's a lot of challenges. So one of the, one of the ways that, that we and other independents have combated that is to, is to open the movie for a week, which is expensive enough in itself, but at least we're closing it down and then we're opening again at the end of January, hopefully with, and when we're opening it, we're opening it with Oscar nominations and we're in a period when all of these movies have been playing between five and 10 weeks. So we have, it, it's, it's so much better for so many different reasons. But do you run the risk of not getting those Oscar nominations and then thereby sort of like all your reviews have run and everything else? You can reprint reviews. I mean, there's almost no downside except unless you really, you know, are going for the brass ring and you really think the movie can do, you know, $40 million. There's almost no downside because we, we, we get the review, we can reprint the entire review, which we did on Beautiful. Um, you know, you can, you can siphon out the bad reviews. So say you get a good review in New York and a bad review in LA. You, you bury the LA review and you, you know, trumpet the New York review a month later. So you have much better uh, 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 a way to control the information. And if you don't get the nominations at all, you're still no worse off because you're releasing in February and March, which are a quieter, quieter period for an older audience film like this. And you're not competing with, you know, the artist and, 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 and Carnage and Iron Lady and extremely loud and, you know, uh, uh, seven other films. But I think also, uh, from a completely non-Oscar perspective, part of the problem is releasing into the season, you have all the big movies that are being released into Christmas season, which is pricing up your your P&A to release any movie. Forget Oscar and non-Oscar for kind of, you know, from Thanksgiving through the end of the year is so increased in pricing that just to put a movie out, you know, you see, so forget just the competition of Oscars. When a movie out is so much more expensive, I, I don't know the exact number, you probably know better, but 20, 30% higher at least. Yeah. Cost of media fourth quarter is, is higher no matter what. Then you throw in all of the extra competition where you have to break through and it's ridiculous. Right, it makes it very difficult for small movies. Well, I wonder if you can give us a sense, specifically with your movies, what did an Oscar nomination mean financially to the bottom line of Crash, of The Fighter? Howard, of some of your movies um, that came out in the last year, what did it mean to the bottom line? Waging a campaign, which obviously costs millions. Well, it depends on where the film is in its projected revenue stream and distribution. So for a movie like Crash, we had done all of our box office. The film had been on DVD since September. One thing that it did was cement it in the public's mind so that for something like five years after Crash won Best Picture, it was the number one requested movie in Netflix for five straight years. Um, it, was, it was remarkable. Um, so there was a lot of ancillary revenues um, to it. For a film like Monster's Ball or Affliction or what Howard's doing with Albert Knobs, um, it's all about the theatrical. Those, those four weeks between nomination day and and what we would call election day, um, is like those are the four weeks that change the world in the theatrical box office for an Oscar-nominated film. So if you're, if you're releasing a film timed to the nominations, it's, it's kind of everything theatrical. Other times, if you release a picture in the fall, summer, like a Hurt Locker, it was all about the DVD. Hurt Locker was something of a theatrical bust, but it was ridiculously successful on, on DVD. So it kind of depends on, on where you are. Well, is, it, is, it, is that the reason why most people don't um, release Oscar contenders early in the year because there really is no financial upside to to wage for a trophy. Uh, I don't, I'm sorry, you guys. No, um, I don't think so. I, I think most of the reason people don't is because they think it'll be forgotten by then, and also there's a lot of 
Um, people always want to do what, what is perceived to have been successful before. Very few people want to be innovators. Lots of people, even though they don't say it out loud, prefer to be followers. And so the fall is, is the traditional Oscar season, so that's when you're supposed to release a movie. That gives you plausible deniability. If you release it in the season when it was supposed to be released and it doesn't work, gee, at least I did the right thing. <laughs> if you try something new and it doesn't work, you were a moron. <laughs> so anyway, with... Um, <laughs> Um, or at least I, so I've been told. Um, anyway, with, uh, with the movie Like a Crash or, or others, there are the DVD in, uh, revenues. Like if Hurt Locker had gone out in November, December, God only knows if it would have won Best Picture. But if it did ancillary performance relative to its box office, that movie was a financial disaster, I'm guessing. Um, but having the DVD come out time to award season was a, was a boon. Um, so it could, it could play either way. I think for us, I can just, from last year, uh, just looking at Fighter, I mean, we, on that movie, our initial projection was probably 20 to $30 million of box office. We looked at it as not a, we didn't, we didn't green light that movie on a, a big commercial projected, you know, uh, home run. We, we green light it on. We'll make a few dollars at this level, and we like the movie a lot, and we believe in it. Um, when it started getting critical acclaim and, and people, you know, enjoyed the movie, I think we started up into the 50, 60, 70 range. And I can, I, I might be off a little bit on the numbers, but I, we were still in our theatrical run. Um, we actually benefit. I think the differential between probably 80 and 100 million in box office, which if you run that through kind of a waterfall of what that means for DVD and what that means for TV and everything else, it was it was very significant for us. That is huge. I'm kind of curious, um, Howard. You know, at what point do you start mentioning Oscar? Do you seriously think you've got an Oscar campaign? I know when you picked up Albert Knobs, it was top of mind that this could go. Obviously, with Glenn Close and the whole thing, but Margin Call, which you mentioned before was more of a surprise that it did as well as it did, and you actually did qualify it quietly, right? Well, it came up, in, you know, we bought the movie in Sundance, and it, came, it definitely came up at the time, because, and they had, the producers had, had, had a whole bonus structure for the actors based on awards, so they were certainly hoping for it. And we had the discussion, and, and certainly we were, we were open to it, but I think, you know, to, to what both, you know, Tom and Ryan were saying, I think, you know, you, you make a plan going in, you try and sort of, you know, deal with the, 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 the different possibilities and the level of innovation you're comfortable with. I mean, and especially for independence, you can't, you, you, there, there's, there's no looseness. You sort of have to say, we're, we're going into this, you know, war, essentially, of, of, of releasing into award season, or you're not. And I think, on the, in the case of Margin Call and in the case of Winter's Bone, the year before, we made the very conscious decision, we were going to make these movies successful without awards. And in the case of Beautiful last year and Albert Knobs this year, we were like, we, we are going to release these movies into award season. We're going to, you know, uh, get in our battle fatigues and do, and do battle. And so Margin Call, you know, we, we, we thought it might have awards potential, but we looked at it the way we did with Winter's Bone, which certainly we thought had awards potential. It had won awards in Sundance, but we thought, you know, we don't think it's going to make it in that period when we, or, nor do we want to spend into that period. So, in both those cases, we we thought let's make the movie successful. If it has have, has awards potential, that'll be gravy. And we certainly wanted to be eligible for them. And in the case of Margin Call, because we released it day and date on video on demand, we did a qualifying run beforehand, so there would be no question that it was, you know. A quiet uh, qualifying a, a, run. A so quiet that qualifying you weren't run. like spending and getting reviews and things. You sort of right. snuck it. That in. was different, right. That was a quiet qualifying run, you know, at the at the Lemley in Fallbrook. And we didn't want, you know, to to anyone to know that it had happened. Yeah. You know, so much of the uh, acquisition marketplace at the festivals now is based upon a day and date theatrical VOD release as it has happened with Margin Call. And now Margin Call is one of those rare movies that people are talking about in a number of categories for Oscars. Do you think that the film is penalized if it's not a, a, a traditional theatrical release? I don't think so. I mean, I guess we'll find out. I mean, if anything, we may get penalized that we didn't, you know, kind of 
put it into the Oscar Derby and there were certain, you know, aspects to that. It wasn't in Telluride or Toronto. You know, I think those, pro those aspects of it, you know, we weren't spending towards awards from the very beginning. Um, it had played Berlin, so it was, and it had played um, some other American festivals, so it, it didn't really, it wasn't really even eligible to play t uh, Telluride in Toronto. But um, I think if it's penalized for anything in the awards race, it will be because we didn't sort of go all out for awards for it. I don't think the VOD is actually significant at all. I think that, um, it, that in fact, I think more people have seen it because of it. So I think that that's actually been a plus. And the HFPA said to us that they were really, that they were excited by the new model. So I think that, um, I, I don't think it's a negative. From, for, at all. I think if anything, it's just, you know, the positioning. We've had to sort of catch up to its um, acclaim. I see. Well, what do you guys think? If you'd had that movie, would you have said, hey, this could win awards, let's put it out theatrically? What do you think about that, making that decision and doing a day and date VOD? I mean, from, from our perspective, we, we run it, you know, we run a little bit of a different business in the sense that we're not really, I don't know, I don't know how to say this probably, but we're not really ever going for an award, meaning you know, even with Fighter, you know, we, we felt we had a great movie, but we just looked at it as, let's put it out, you know, release it as a normal movie, and, and if it gets the attention that, you know, it, it may get, then we'll talk about awards, and we really didn't decide to, to even push it as an award movie until we really knew that we had that kind of momentum. Um, so it's hard, I think, for, at least from our, our perspective, to answer that question, you know, because we don't really, we're not in the business of, of finding movies and, 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 you know, using the awards to build them. It's kind of a, a secondary benefit if, if it happens. That's interesting, Tom. You know, I'm sure you've had a lot of experience with this, you know, of buying movies, getting movies, and then having to make the decision, do you go for the awards run or do you not? And uh, do, do you put the financial health of the movie and what's best for the movie first or, or Oscar glory? Um, Oscar glory can't ever be first. Not Certainly not if you're on an independent panel. Um, <laughs> Just, just can't. Um, I, I do think the, the question for Margin Call, and, and I thought Margin Call was a terrific film. Um, I don't know what the answer is to, to Mike's question, whether it gets dinged a little bit for having gone with a less pure theatrical release or not. Time will, time will tell. I think the only real important question, though, is, and not necessarily germane to, to this weekend, but I think the, the more important question is the financial model involved. So Margin Call has been successful theatrically. It's been successful on VOD. The only thing that matters is would it have been more successful, given kind of the surprise theatrical hit that it was, would it have been more successful theatrically without a VOD or not? And I'm not second guessing at all. I have no idea and haven't thought about it more than 12 seconds. Uh, yeah, well, we have, we've of course, you know, sliced, diced, and talked about it, uh, you know, a million times. Um, and, you know, it, it comes back, it, it, it's, 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 you know, woulda, coulda, shoulda. I don't, you know, it's very, very hard to know because. For it to have done appreciably better theatrically, we would have had to spend a lot more out of the gate. And so there was that decision that probably wouldn't have been made for that movie, even if it wasn't going on VOD. In other words, were you going to spend 10 million out of the gate to do 20, 30, 40 million? Nobody really thought that was the right thing to do for that movie. I'm still not sure if it was right. It, it, it could be. And would it have done more if it, someone had spent 10 million to open it? Yes. So, it, but it was that decision, not the VOD decision that was that was central to its final, uh, 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 you know, box office. It's going to be very profitable for the way that we did it. So, you know, rolling the dice on a three and a half million dollar movie with ten million in P and A is a big question mark for anybody in any company. So, um, you know, a small film that that takes place in a in a in a you know in one room was shot in 17 days and you know a, a, a very very serious and dialogue driven um, and, and and even with Occupy Wall Street we asked we looked at ourselves and it turned out to be a great publicity engine for the film but we 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 up till the day it opened I said is it going to be that people are going to say why well, don't want to see this movie that's you know uh, dealing with the the headlines because uh, uh, we'd had other films that were topical you know so I really was not sure it would work it still because I thought is it going to see like broccoli or are people going to be fascinated by it and it turns out they were fascinated by it you know because it was in the news as well but you know you we certainly didn't know that it was a hard call well now um, many of the films that have been discussed at this weekend at, at our panels have been films that I wrote about when there were acquisitions made at 
particularly in Sundance, it was like an extravaganza, and can and a little bit of Toronto. There were a couple of contenders that came out of that. When you go to these festivals now and you decide whether to, to acquire, let's say, a movie like Pariah or uh, like Crazy, how much does the idea of, of doing some business in Oscar season, getting nominations, how much does that sway you as to whether or not to invest in that film as an acquisition? Well, speaking for myself, you always have to guard against buying into the hype and even buying into your own hype. Um, there have been certain times a film launches at a festival. Either you bring your own film to a festival or you're thinking about acquiring a film there. And it seems pretty clear that unless you really screw it up, this picture is going to get nominated for an Oscar. Um, when Gods and Monsters premiered at Sundance way back when, and we liked the movie very much, but it was a challenging economic equation. Showtime had financed the film, and you had to buy them out of a theatrical window, so it was very complicated. But as we were reading the clippings, and this was back in 1998, and so we looked, this was you know, Stone Ages, so we still had to have our publicity people in LA actually fax reviews up to Park City <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, to, to learn about it. But as I remember sitting on, on the bus in Park City going through this pile of faxes on Gods and Monsters and saying, gee, unless I'm a total moron, Ian McKellen's getting nominated for Best Actor. And that gave us some confidence to go out and be just a teeny bit more more aggressive, but um, but if you're if you're buying a film because you're convinced it's it's Oscar worthy and is going to get nominated, and those nominations will help the financial performance of the picture, you better be right because, as Howard has alluded to, and, and Ryan as well, it gets really expensive to play in that game. So if you're buying it because you think it's going to get awards, and those awards are what it takes to propel the box office, if you're wrong, you're doubly wrong. You've overspent, and you get no awards, and then you don't do any box office, and so you're really really out. So it's it's a toughie. When, and one thing I'd like to add to is. Both of, of the, the people next to me are who are, I'd say, um, have a talent that we don't have and we've recognized is a very unique talent that kind of passes uh, over and, and, and people don't recognize it, but it's the ability to acquire. Meaning, you know, we as a company, Relativity, have tried and we've acquired quite a bit and we make our own movies as well. And, you know, it kind of seems like a, a simple thing. Oh, well, they bought a movie that everybody liked and, you know, well, look, it got, you know, won, it won these awards. Well, we've bought plenty of movies that everybody liked and we've learned the acquisition business is a very, very difficult business that requires a very keen eye and a very proper release pattern and you know people that know what they're doing in that specific market and, and it's one market we have not been successful at and um, we've kind of this year stayed away from it because of that and both of these guys have done a tremendous job going to those festivals and you know it, it sounds so easy I could tell you from first-hand experience five six seven eight nine acquired movies later it's really hard and it's it's just as hard as you know making a movie from scratch and 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 you know making sure that you, you you don't buy into the hype and you don't buy the movie and go, well, everybody loved it so much at this festival, so let's just spend the money. Um, and, and both of you guys you know, have done a tremendous job at that. Thank you. I, but I think that, that one of the keys to that, it's like so many other things, you know, practice makes or almost perfect in the sense that it's, it's, only, it's the only thing we're doing or mostly the only thing we're doing. And I think we've certainly fallen flat on our face many times, but we're doing it you know, all day long, every day, all year long. So, you know, you really try and make it as scientific as you can be, obviously. You know, and I, I listen a lot to my partners at my company. You know, a number of the movies that have been successful I didn't like that we have required because I listen to the group and really like try and try and get other voices in the mix. And um, you know, we and we've we've definitely um, fallen on our face, but one of the things that we do is we never we, we never try to take too much risk with any one film. And to your point, you know, I think the Oscars, I don't want to say it's the last thing we think about, but it is way down on the list in terms of the, the acquiring of a film because if a film can't succeed without it, that's very scary. And I think, um, you know, re re launching into this period is very tricky and I think, you know, we do it with, you know, only real, you know, trepidation and thinking it through and, you know, having uh, usually some kind of financial partner on it because it's so expensive and, you know, just deciding that's the only way, in a way, to make the movie successful. That's why I say, like, with Margin Call, the fact that it might have been successful being released into Oscar season, I'm happier that we didn't. The movie's a hit for us and for Lionsgate, who's our partner on it, and now, you know, whether it gets Oscar attention is gravy, which is fantastic. It's such a more comfortable position to be in. 
Well, let me just ask you in following up with that, are there actors, are filmmakers, directors, very high profile people who actually make it part of their contract that you must release this film for Oscar consideration? Was that a part of the consideration maybe of Albert Nobbs? Did Glenn Close produced it as well, so. Yeah, that was, that was in the air when they were showing the film. So I will say that that was, it was not said, you know, we won't sell you the movie unless you're gonna do an Oscar campaign, but it was, when we saw the movie, everybody agreed that that was the right thing to do for the film, so there wasn't really a question. When we, when we saw the movie, we, we, we felt like that's a movie, because of her particular career and, and this exact moment and the story of this film, it all made sense. Uh, you know, it, it, if, we had, if we had said no, we want to release it at some other time, they might still have sold it to us, but I think they, we were all in agreement that th that was the right thing to do for this movie. So it wasn't contentious in that way, like, well, we want to release it you know, in the spring. Well, no, we wanted you to do an Oscar campaign. It never came to that, so if it had, I don't know where it would have gone. And I think that there are movies that we've turned down for that reason, where, they, where, where an actor said, oh, you, you know, we want to do a campaign for this movie, and we're, we, we were like, you know, we either have a film that's in that category, or we don't agree with you that that's the right way to go. So, you know, I think it's a very, it's a very tough decision to make to, 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 for an independent to release into this season. So I think it, you know, all of the signs have to make sense, and you have to feel like it's, it's the best way to make the movie succeed financially. Tom, you had a similar situation. You went the other way. When you acquired The Gray, when people were looking at that film, the Joe Carnahan film, a lot of people were saying, well, Liam Neeson could possibly become nominated for an Oscar. And it's not this year's business, it's next year's business. What, what went into that decision to not release this year? Um, there, were, there were a few things. Um, the film's amazing, um, and I think Liam will absolutely be taken very seriously as a contender for Best Actor next year, as will the film in a, in a number of categories. Um, everybody can go on Twitter when you leave and check out all the reactions from our screening up at Numathon at 8 o'clock this morning in Austin. Um, film played amazing, we're happy to report. Um, but it's a, it's, it's a strong commercial movie. The movie's terrific, we expect very good reviews. Liam, I think, gives one of, if not his, the best performance of his career. Um, but it's a, it's a smart action thriller, and we didn't want to confuse any messages of a year-end awards campaign. The film also um, was, um, was very late in finishing. So I didn't think we had the time to do a, a campaign. Um, Joe, just, Joe Carnahan just locked the picture. Um, Liam is in Turkey filming Taken 2 as we speak. Um, so all signs pointed towards next year is really the best time, but, but the movie is terrific and we look forward to running a strong campaign for it next year. I mean, that, that's, a, that's a really interesting point. Yeah, because it's come up briefly, but worth, worth mentioning is the talent has to work the film. I mean, you talked about Hallie on, um, on Monsters Ball and Liam's unavailability. I mean, we have two actors in Margin Call, Kevin Spacey, who's been performing Richard III around the world, is right now in China for a long period, and Jeremy Irons shooting the Borgias in Budapest. They're not here. They couldn't even come here. They, <laughs> Kevin Spacey came for us 24 hours to do the premiere in October, so we don't have the actors. So we, we obviously we can launch a kind of campaign. We did a, a Golden Globe Skype conference from Sydney. Um, <laughs> so, so, you know, they, they there, that informs the the decision. You know, uh, Glenn Close has 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 you know uh, negotiated with her damages production people. You know, ad nauseum until they are, are, are ready to kill her because she's had to leave four or five times to come back here, and that was just you know she has enough time with that show to 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 be able to do it. But it's it's been difficult, and I think that the actors have to be in L.A. to work the film uh, uh, for an Oscar campaign, and that isn't always possible. It's interesting because I did interview. Kevin Spacey, he was in an elevator in a Singapore hotel <laughs> calling me on behalf of Margin Call after he did a Richard, you know, the third performance. So it's kind of funny. There are ways I guess you can do it. He's anxious to participate, but obviously not here. I, I'll just add or, or triple that, uh, that thought, which is, you know, last year I think with Fighter, the only reason we were able to even get attention other than the fact that there was 10 slots um, really was because of the talent's participation and over-participation, meaning in a, in a good way. It was, it was one of those circumstances where between Mark and Christian and David O. Russell and Melissa and Amy, I mean, everybody showed up to 
just, you know, constant, oh, you know, as many panels, as many discussions, as many screenings, as many Q and A's, and it's the only way we were able to compete with majors who were spending, you know, 10, 15, 20 million dollars that we didn't have to spend on a, a campaign, and it's because they loved the movie and believed in it, you know, they really showed up everywhere. I mean, I've never seen actors and, and directors just work it more. I mean, every day was another city, another, you know, state, another uh, screening, another discussion. And that's key if you're going to try and compete, I think. Well, especially, again, you're trying to compete with less money. So, it's like, one of the things you should be able to have is your actor working it, you know. And, and you know, with Winter's Bone, we had Jennifer Lawrence shooting um, uh, X-Men in London. So it was it, it was brutal. And, I, and, you know, Tom Rothman was my boss long ago. I called him up and said, please, please let her go for 24 hours. And it was like a, it was like a state, you know, international mission <laughs> to get her to, to be able to come back to do that cocktail party that we did at Pally House. I think you were there. Um, it was like, you know, the, 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 the level of, of, of negotiation to, to get her off the set for, for it was a little more than 24 hours. And, and then she was done by the time a lot of the stuff was in, in, in mid-December and January. But, you know, I, I think that that's a big consideration uh, about uh, uh, doing an Oscar campaign is talent availability. You know, one of, the, one of the most daring acquisitions of this year, I think, was Harvey Weinstein getting the artist just before Can swooped in, he grabbed it, as he's done many times over the years. And I wonder, if you'd had that opportunity, that moment to seize that picture, it's a black and white film, it's a silent film, I have no idea what the commercial prospects are. Would you have grabbed it if you'd had that time at that moment, right before Can? I, I could say from my perspective, we would not have. And not, not saying that it wouldn't work, just saying, you know, as I said, we've traditionally not had the best success with acquisitions. So they're very tough to do. Harvey's a genius at that. And you know, I'm sure he'll figure out the right way to make it work. But having seen the movie, I, I, I personally you know, would look at it. And even having listened to our team in the past, if there was a clear path to here's how we think we can make money, it would be too much of a gamble for us. I think I would have wanted to buy it. But I totally give him credit for the vision for seeing how Far it could go. I would have. I would have said this will be a great small specialty movie. It's really the audience will lo will love it. You know, it'll do five or ten million dollars. That's that. I think I would have. I would not have not have seen the had the vision to see where I think it's going to go now because I would have compared it to like Perseverance, which you know did I think around five, and I think I would not have seen this level of acc acclaim. Finally, you know, um, this Oscar season, you're all Academy members. Take. Take your films aside here. Do you think this is a good year in terms of quality and things? And are there, when you sit down with your ballot beyond your own movie, are there 10 movies that you can honestly vote for uh, for best picture? Well, Ryan and I don't really have uh, <laughs> dogs in this hunt. So uh, it's, as Ryan, I think, alluded to earlier, it's, it's a lot more fun <laughs> to not have a, a horse in the race and just sit back and watch everybody else blow their brains out. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, Pretty much. <laughs> so uh, I've, I've, I haven't seen everything yet. Um, I've seen a lot, of, a lot of great films. My expectation is that by the time I've caught up with everything, I'll, I'll feel good about the number of, of terrific films out there, but I, I've seen a number already that, that I would be proud to to fill in a, a ballot with. I just kind of, I would second that, uh, you know, it, it's really nice to this year actually be able to sit back and enjoy the, the films for them, what they are, and not be uh, working, I think as we talked about before this, a second career, which it really is, <laughs> running an academy, academy campaign. You can't enjoy this time at all. You're not paying, you can't really even pay attention to, you know, what's such an, a beautiful part of our business because you're so focused on your movie and, you know, doing what you need to do and wrangling talent. But um, I haven't seen all the movies yet. What I've seen from what I've seen I, uh, so far, I think it's going to be easy to find 10 movies. There's some just amazing movies out there. People took big chances this year. Again, chances that I don't know that we'll ever take, um, but that I watch and commend. And, and, and you know, it, it's, it's awesome to see, you know, true art and, and artists. And that's really what this is about, and be able to sit back and say, that was a risk someone took, and you know it turned out to be a beautiful movie, and it turned out to be something that's getting the recognition. So, um, I've probably seen half of the movies so far. I'd say there's there's very few that I've gone. Well, I'm disappointed, you know, or it's it's it's, it's been underwhelming. 
Uh, well, I am in the middle of it, so I've watched most of the films. I haven't seen, um, I haven't seen Extremely Loud, I haven't seen um, Carnage, and I haven't seen uh, Dragon Tattoo, but I think I've seen almost everything else. Um, and, you know, I think there are great films this year. I loved The Descendants. Um, I loved Hugo. Those were, you know, two fantastic films that I think will stand the test of time. I think there are certainly eight other films that are that are really, really good. And, uh, uh, you know, I'll, I'll put our, our margin call and Albert Knobs in that, in that category. I think that, um, that this year I don't feel as many kind of old-fashioned studio dramatic films that I, or, or for lack of a better, better way to describe it, I think that a lot of the interesting films are coming more out of the independent world. And last year there was The Social Network and The Fighter and True Grit and movies that were sort of bigger, more old Hollywood, you know, kind of prestige pictures. And now they feel like a bunch of independent films and, and that's fine, but it is different. Fighter was small, little budget. Yeah, I guess it, it, didn't, it, didn't, it didn't feel that way, it didn't feel like, but it wasn't a small festival I, film, I, you know. I know. I'm just kidding. Talking, yeah, because I think, I think of, you know, the artist and even, you know, d the descendants as growing more sort of out of, out of real independent filmmaking and, and uh, uh, you know, we need to talk about Kevin and, you know, Albert Knobs and Margin Call and I feel like there are more of those that are, you know, and Martha, Marcy, May, Marley, mov movies that are coming out of that sphere and that, and, and it's, it's, it, it indicates what's going on at the studios. The studios are not interested in making, you know, for lack of, well, I think of some movies of the past, like A Beautiful Mind, and movies that got made with real budgets, with big stars that were, you know, dramatic films. They're just not making them. And I feel that a little bit. I feel like those choices aren't there. I mean, the independents certainly are, you know, making up the difference in Tinker Ta Taylor, Soldier Spy, you know, that sort of filling in the difference, but it is different. That, that's a sort of foreign-made film that was British, you know, British-driven. I mean, and, and I feel like the studios made more of those in past years, and it seems each passing year are make, making fewer of them. Well, let's hope that, that they will make more of them. And, um, you know, I thank you all for coming out here. It's a really fascinating discussion, this, this business called Oscar. And, uh, you know, so thank you so much, Tom Ortenberg, Ryan Kavanaugh, and Howard Cohen, and Mike Fleming. Thank you.